yeah, hey everyone, it's a pleasure to have you all here and it's really exciting to be able to connect the dots between um, you, the COVID forecasters um, on Metaculus and the modelers and decision makers who make use of those forecasts. Um, but first, I'd really like to thank the partners of this event. Um, we really value the continued partnership of the Virginia Department of Health um, over the last six months as we've collaborated in bringing Metaculous forecasts um, directly into the realm of public health policy in Virginia. And then it was really exciting to then subsequently um, be introduced to the researchers at the University of Virginia's Biocomplexity Institute. Um, so the, the expansion of our collaboration to include um, your modeling work has brought that additional dimension of um, computational modeling uh, into this project, which is great. Um, and so I and the rest of the Metaculous team are really looking forward to hearing from this panel. And um, I believe all of uh, the attendees will really enjoy the presentations our partners will give. Um, but before that, I'll share some background information about Metaculous for those of you who might not be all that familiar with it. Um, so Metaculous is the world's largest probabilistic forecasting platform. Uh, we have an established and publicly viewable track record of uh, over five years, and we have a network of thousands of forecasters. Um, anyone with an interest in uh, making predictions and getting better at prediction making um, is more than welcome to join. And you'll find that you can even create new questions that are of interest to you. Um, our questions mostly relate to science and tech, um, which are areas where um, relying on the historical uh, record um, is difficult because those records often don't exist or not really applicable. Um, but our forecasters um, have been more then up to the task of making forecasts in science and tech um, and our aggregations of predictions from forecasters have both good resolution and have been well calibrated. Um, so as part of our science oriented focus since early 2020, Metaculous has fielded many, many COVID questions that cover a wide array of topics relating to the pandemic um, from the evolution of SARS-CoV-2 to its epidemiological trajectory in multiple countries to its economic and political impacts. So you, the forecasters, have again and again proven yourselves to be highly engaged in both making predictions on the hundreds of COVID questions that we've had, um, as well as in writing new questions. Um, and some of our forecasters have even very impressively sounded the alarm on COVID as early as January 2020, um, and have since then warned about new variants that have come to become dominant. Um, so in the modeling and decision-making spaces, especially uh, the pandemic has demonstrated this pressing need for um, timely and accurate quantitative forecasts to help reduce the uncertainty around key pressing questions. And so today's discussion with uh, the University of Virginia's Biocomplexity Institute and the Virginia Department of Health uh, will help shed some light on how the forecasts you have made on our platform have translated into the computational modeling and public health decision-making spaces. So between this past August and September, um, we partnered with UVA's Biocomplexity Institute to run four weekly rounds of the Virginia Lightning Round Tournament to ask questions that might help improve their models. And since April, we have been running the Keep Virginia Safe Tournament um, in collaboration with uh, VDH to help map, map out the trajectory of COVID in Virginia and inform public health decision making. Uh, and it's now my pleasure to introduce Justin Crow, um, a super forecaster and the director of the Division of Social Epidemiology at the Virginia Department of Health. Um, and Justin will speak on the results of this ongoing partnership between Metaculus and the Virginia Department of Health. Great, thank you, Juan. Let me go ahead and uh, share my screen here. All right, perfect. Great, yes, thank you all for joining us today and thank you, uh, Metaculous, for hosting this event. It's very exciting to uh, discuss this, this work that I've been doing for 
uh, almost a year and a half now. Uh, I'm going to kind of go over Virginia Department of Health's approach to uh, COVID-19 forecast, foresight and forecasting um, and, and the route we've taken and are continuing to develop and evolve going forward. Uh, Juan went over my background, but just to uh, kind of dive in a bit to what that means, I am normally uh, for the past six years, I've uh, been the director of the Division of Social Epidemiology and the Office of Health Equity. Um, normally we focus on social determinants of health, health equity and health disparities, access to care issues. Uh, of course, I am also uh, uh, identified as a super forecaster. Uh, I joined uh, the Good Judgment Project halfway through season three uh, and participated as a super forecaster in season four and then worked uh, sporadically with the, uh, you know, the spin-off uh, Good Judgment Incorporated uh, until the pandemic began. Uh, of course, when the pandemic began, uh, a lot of us in the public health world took on two jobs. Uh, mine was, uh, ended up being to coordinate the modeling work done by uh, UVA, uh, RAND, and, and uh, other partners, uh, and now Metaculus. Um, all right. So if you think back to where we were when I started this work back in uh, March and early April of 2020, uh, of course, uh, uh, coronavirus had hit China pretty hard uh, uh, in Wuhan, and they were their hospital systems were overwhelmed. You can remember they were building hospitals in 10 days there, uh, very exciting uh, technology and, and uh, they were using there. Um, it had jumped over to uh, Italy, uh, and of course Italy has a world-class first world health system, uh, but uh, COVID had pushed it to the breaking point and passed it. Um, if you'll recall, there were some uh, uh, triaging going through there and some of our equity work uh, at the very beginning was to uh, provide guidance uh, uh, on uh, what we would do or what we would uh, recommend to hospitals uh, if they entered the, uh, you know, had the same uh, issue. Uh, nationally, of course, in the US, um, a lot of policy options were being discussed, quarantines of New York, uh, there's Trump sending the USS Comfort, uh, normally stationed here at the uh, Naval Base in, in Norfolk, uh, in Virginia, uh, up to New York City. Uh, and then, of course, uh, governors throughout the uh, U.S. were planning uh, field hospitals as well. Uh, this one is uh, one being built in Washington State. Um, so you can imagine that uh, policymakers in Virginia were very... Uh, concerned uh, and wondering if they should do the same thing. So these are some of the models that were at the time. This is uh, from a presentation that we created for policymakers on April 7th, 2020. This is the University of Washington's IHME model. I'm sure some of you have forecasted are familiar with this, but it showed uh, our peak number of hospitalizations would occur in April 2020 at just under 3,000. Uh, and then 560 ICU beds would be needed. And I don't know if you can see the small print there, but we would not have a bed shortage under this scenario. We would have indeed about 3,000, almost 3,000 uh, beds available. You compare that to what the University of Pennsylvania's CHIME model was saying for Virginia, uh, same presentation, uh, the peak was be in late May uh, with 40, almost 40,000 hospitalizations and almost 15,000 ICU beds needed. Uh, that would of course drive us over the brink um, if that occurred. Uh, so what is a policymaker to do? Of course, uh, if you're a good forecaster, you might average those two and we'd still be over the brink. But as a, uh, a government official, you prepare for the worst. Uh, our, uh, we were preparing to turn our convention center in Hampton Roads into a uh, field hospital. And of course, uh, throughout the state, we had uh, several field hospitals planned. Of course, by late April, in early May, uh, beds were going unfulfilled. You'll recall uh, throughout the US, uh, makeshift hospitals pretty much weren't used and often weren't used for COVID patients. And so there's some headlines that occurred at the time. Uh, but here in Virginia, in mid-April, prior to other states kind of turning away from that, Virginia was already pivoting away from field hospitals. So we just hit pause. So we had cleared out one of our dorms at VCU where I graduated from. Uh, and then stopped because <laughs> uh, we were going to put a field hospital in there. Um, and the reason why, and this is uh, Danny Avula stating uh, way back then, April 17th, 2020, at a news conference, um, uh, you know, why we were pivoting away from field hospitals. And they specifically mentioned the UVA COVID 19 forecasting model. So, what we had done in, in March uh, and April, early April 2020, is we had begun an intensive search to identify the best model for Virginia. I think this is a uh, you know, pretty astounding, uh, outstanding uh, work that was done by our policymakers to try to really get ahead uh, and understanding of what was coming down the pike as far as COVID was concerned, get good forecasts. 
Um, we hired a consultant with RAND uh, by the name of Carter Price, uh, who uh, guided this effort for us, provided uh, technical expertise into modeling. Uh, and we ended up selecting the University of Virginia Biocomplexity Institute, you'll hear from in a bit. Um, they have extensive experience in disease modeling in Virginia, uh, and they could create county level models for us. So county level projections using county level information uh, uh, and county level modeling. Uh, and there's the uh, announcement from the governor's office there on the bottom right. Uh, and of course, what they looked at was that, uh, you know, once the press word got out about COVID and uh, the governor started instituting some uh, public health restrictions, we saw a pretty steep decline in transmission rates and a pretty, pretty steep de decline in uh, mobility among uh, Virginians. Uh, so uh, the reproduction number changed from 2.2 to 1.1. So that 1.1 means that every case will uh, result in another 1.1 cases. So a very slow kind of growth rate there. Um, and they looked at this under several scenarios. Uh, you know, there are five listed here. Um, one was a slow, if we managed to slow the spread through April 30th, uh, or if we slow the spread through June 30th, or if we have more restrictive mandates uh, through April 30th or through June 10th. And then of course the unmitigated scenario, which is a lot of what the, you know, say the time model, those really high estimates we're looking at. What would happen if we did nothing, if people didn't change their behavior, no policies were put in place. Uh, and then we would have those big peaks in April to early May, but if we kept the pause in till June 10th, we would have to till mid-July or August before we started, uh, and you can see on the charts there, uh, exceeding hospital capacity in any of our regions. You can kind of see the slow rise through the end of June or mid-June, uh, and then kind of the takeoff in cases. And this is from their uh, uh, April 22nd uh, presentation to uh, policymakers. Um, so what that did was it bought us time to uh, turn away from those field hospitals, uh, you know, saved us untold costs, you know, hard to know how much this, this would have cost us for daily use, but we knew we had the time if we needed to, to, uh, uh, to build those back up or to restart those processes if we needed to. Um, and this is just a sort of a, a visualization of those uh, scenarios. You can see the unmitigated here is huge and then through the June 10th pause. So that kind of forecasting, uh, that modeling uh, uh, was essential. And we continue to use scenarios, just wanna uh, kind of give an update on how we, we continue to use modeling. We continue to create scenarios. So these are showing the, the most recent scenarios from the latest update from UVA. And you can see there's a, we're looking now at the holidays uh, upcoming, if we're gonna have a repeat from last year. Um, we have our, what we call our adaptive, which is a kind of the current course of the pandemic. And then if we put in some intensive measures uh, to uh, restrict transmission, what that might look like. So we still have uh, those in there. And then we have a look at what we call an optimistic vaccine scenario. If we can really ramp up uh, vaccinations, what that will look like. So, but we continue to use this scenario approach. And a lot of the work we do with UVA is building those scenarios, uh, kind of trying to understand those. Um, so what those scenarios, they're most useful for policymakers. Uh, they help uh, policymakers understand the impact of policy decisions. Uh, they help to inform and persuade stakeholders and to educate the public about policy options and to explain and justify decisions. Um, and I have this up here. This was, you know, this ability to explain decisions and educate the public about uh, policy options was, was really important. Um, so this was a, a press conference, uh, you know, of course, virtual at the time, uh, hosted by our Secretary of uh, Health and Human Resources, Daniel Carey. Um, it was an hour long press conference held just to talk about the modeling in Virginia and its implications uh, for policy here in Virginia. So uh, uh, the governor's office, uh, you know, really took the, really uh, embraced the modeling and, and took it seriously, uh, which was great to see. Um, it's not quite as useful for planning. We do use those plan for planning and this chart, oops, go back, uh, kind of shows how we use it. We can see there, uh, different peaks in cases and different times in our different local health districts throughout the state. So we use it to uh, direct anything from testing resources to medical examiner resources uh, to different areas of the state. It's been used at different times in that way. Um, but it's not as useful because you have to know which scenario will play out. That's the big, the big question I always get as soon as I talk about the scenarios. Well, which one's gonna play out? And of course, all else is not equal. We know that there are some things uh, where the models struggle to uh, predict. One, a new event generally. And of course, we're dealing with a novel coronavirus. Uh, that transmission rate, you know, we were still bringing in a lot of information to try to figure that out. 
Um, and of course, we continue to get new variants where, with new characteristics that we're trying to understand. Uh, rare events, we had uh, you know, civil unrest, BLM protests uh, that brought people together last uh, summer and Richmond, Virginia was uh, right at the center of that. And the, the Lee Monument here, um, renamed Marcus Peters Square. Um, uh, you know, large rallies throughout the, uh, the city. Um, and of course, nat natural disasters are difficult to uh, predict. Um, policy decisions, as we noted, are difficult to pre predict. We have the mandates and the public health restrictions, uh, timing of EUA, uh, emergency use authorizations for treatments and vaccines, and whether those treatments or vaccines will work. And then, of course, human behavior. Uh, I think we were all uh, kind of uh, uh, in the public health world, uh, you know, a little surprised by the pushback for the compliance with our guidance and some of our our mandates and uh, our vaccine uptake uh, here in Virginia and, and throughout the country. Uh, although we've had relatively good uptake here in Virginia. And then the models struggle to understand those peaks and troughs. So when the cases are rising, the models tend to track pretty closely. Uh, when they're declining, same. However, when there's a change in direction, the models often miss that. Uh, so uh, human forecasting and particularly the uh, evidence-based aggregate human forecasting that Metaculus does uh, can fill that gap. Um, so as a super forecaster for quite some time, I was itching to fill that gap, of course, uh, with human forecasting. So uh, we did have an initial connection with Metaculus that I, I had nothing to do with. Um, it was uh, a legislator got in touch with uh, some of our folks in our Office of Epidemiology and uh, the director of our Division of Surveillance and Investigation, uh, Caroline Holsinger, uh, latched onto that as a good solution to a specific question she had at the time, which is how many of our testing samples uh, do we need to sequence in order to understand what's going on with really at that time it was the alpha variant uh, here in Virginia. So this was an operational question with a short time, with a short turnaround time. So we were interested in what the CDC would recommend. So really what would the agency have to do uh, in relation to uh, sequencing. Uh, so that's the kind of a way of saying it wasn't an optimization question. We weren't trying to figure out the best one. We were trying to figure out what uh, the CDC would recommend and what we would have to really purchase and plan for. Uh, so Metaculous provided an answer, about 11% of our samples. Uh, and that information was uh, uh, used to guide our purchase of sequencers at our state lab and uh, to contract with uh, some of our lab partners at UVA and Virginia Tech. So very useful. I'm not aware that the CDC has put out an actual recommendation about this yet, but uh, 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 the uh, team at UVA has uh, put together and modeled some of this work. And the numbers that we came up with were very similar um, to what we actually ended up with for capacity. So um, that worked out very well for us in the end. Uh, and of course, many of you here are familiar with the Keep Virginia Safe Tournament. I probably should have put a slide in for there, but um, our collaboration continues to be a work in progress. So uh, for a lot of policymakers, um, you know, this kind of forecasting is a new concept. A lot of them don't uh, necessarily understand uh, or appreciate quantitative modeling. Uh, you know, um, certainly uh, Governor Northam and his administration were, were an exception to that and uh, really uh, pushed that early on and continue to, uh, to support it. Um, but it can be challenging to communicate to uh, people and understandably so. It's a, it's a completely new way of, uh, of, of looking at things. Um, uh, the use case is, is sometimes unclear to policymakers, uh, and there's a bit of a lack of established credibility in pol policy circles. You don't see too many other states using it and, and that's, uh, um, that's really what a lot of policymakers look at. Are other policymakers using it? Are other states doing it? A lot of times when we have a new question, the first thing we get asked to do is see what other states are doing. Um, so this is, you know, uh, it's a bit of a risk for policymakers to uh, hang their hat on something this new and, uh, and, you know, not use quite as much, even though, you know, Metaculus has a great track record that we can review and understand policymakers uh, a little more difficult. Um, uh, nevertheless, we, we do continue to use, uh, you know, we, we do use the Metaculus predictions, of course, um, um, that's what they're there for. Uh, uh, but we, the, our current uses are, are vac is really our vaccine uptake, trying to understand, we report out every week um, when we will reach that, uh, that 75% um, uh, uh, vaccine uptake. So we report that uh, uh, every week we have a surveillance update and that information is included in the Metaculous forecast 
uh, for that is included. It is a wide range, and we've gotten some pushback about that. The uh, you know the this the kind of seventy five percentile range there, um, uh, 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 but that is has proven useful to policymakers just to understand where we're heading in that direction. Uh, and we also use it weekly to respond to hot topics. So I get a list of hot topics weekly from uh, uh, the, our our surveillance folks, the people who give the the uh, epidemiological surveillance update. Uh, every week. So uh, this week, the one, you know, it's kind of driven by the UVA scenario is will there be a repeat of last year's holiday surge? Will which scenario will we will we hit? Um, so sometimes some of those, uh, uh, you know, forecasts are the way they're specified are difficult to interpret for, you know, those types of questions. They're not, uh, you know, we specify our questions very well for forecasting. Uh, uh, but they don't necessarily respond to what's on the mind of folks at the time. So this is one of the questions I pulled uh, when answering that question. You can kind of see it's, it's difficult to interpret. Uh, there we have a, a, a large a share right there around uh, January. However, uh, I think it was uh, you know, more than 25% believe that the, uh, um, the peak has already happened, is in the past. Uh, and the median, of course, is December. So. Uh, interpreting that is somewhat difficult uh, sometimes for policymakers. So it's difficult for us sometimes to um, uh, uh, put that in a way that policymakers can understand. Uh, so kind of working on that communication and working through it uh, is good. Ultimately, uh, you know, uh, we use that cumulative prediction. This is the uh, the probability density, but the cumulative probability was was very helpful in this regard. Um, and so communication, as I mentioned, is difficult. One of the things that we've uh, struggled with is communicating that, uh, you know, with the modeling, uh, the difference between a prediction and a uh, forecast or a projection. Um, so this is a language of foresight that I just kind of came up with on the fly. We're trying to uh, use a lot of discipline, particularly when we uh, add in metaculous forecasts. Uh, so an estimate is an educated approximation of a current uh, value. Uh, projection is past trends projected forward. And a forecast is that's when you're talking about adding uncertainty qualifiers such as probability or margin of error. Uh, so forecast such as uh, you know work that Metaculus does. And of course, prediction is a certain statement about the future. That's just a language of forecasting, um, uh, but I'm not sure if it will <laughs> uh, be useful, but we're trying to be clear about what we see as a projection and a forecast. Um, and I do want to point out, uh, you know, responding to that question, that hot topic, will there be a winter surge? My favorite question for this has been attendance at the 2021 UVA versus Virginia Tech game. So this is was a question suggested by Carter Price of RAND, who I mentioned earlier. It really sums up a range of factors. It's instantly relatable and can be easily appended to a variety of products. So whenever you're just giving an update and what do um, the Metaculous forecasters think about the, the Tech UVA game this year. Well, attendance is up, it's looking good. So uh, kind of a good return to normalcy there. Uh, and we're working to integrate this into our weekly report uh, for public consumption. And then our next steps, uh, you know, as far as we see them, collaboration with UVA is very exciting. It adds credibility and visibility. Uh, their interpretation is excellent. And uh, we'll be able to integrate it into familiar products and it'll be part of a complete foresight package. Uh, uh, we are working on drawing down the complete data set so we can do a quick analysis and interpretation and uh, kind of make uh, visualizations that are uh, useful to policymakers uh, in the format that they are used to and expect to see uh, from, from our team here at VDH. And we're also looking to incentives as a forecaster. Um, you know, it's a labor of love. Uh, but I know it's a lot of hard work. I know it's a lot of uh, effort and time. Uh, and we do want to recognize that uh, how we can. Uh, whether it's with uh, Schwag or something else, but uh, we are working on the legalities of that uh, on our end to get that done. And uh, I'll just finish with a, with a huge thank you to those who have participated in the tournament and who continue to participate. I think it's a, a great project and I'm excited to see how this collaboration with UVA goes uh, and with us and in, in policymakers and making this a, uh, you know, a turning forecasts into policy. Uh, is, uh, is an excellent effort. So with that, I will turn it over to uh, Brian Lewis of the UVA Biocomplexity Institute to uh, give some insight into their work. Thanks a lot, Justin. As we switch over the screen, they'll just give a quick little uh, bio here. Um, I am Brian Lewis. I uh, 
grew up in Kentucky. I went to college up in Pittsburgh at Carnegie Mellon. I uh, then went off into the Peace Corps. I ended up in the Bay Area from that experience inspired to pursue public health where I met my future wife, which brought me back to Blacksburg, Virginia, where she was pursuing uh, med school. And I met up with the lab that I currently work for that's now a part of the University of Virginia's Biocomplexity Institute. And I'm here to just sort of give an overview of how we've been oper operationalizing forecasts and projections to uh, provide this real-time pandemic support uh, that Justin nicely uh, covered there. Just a little bit about our institute is we try and tackle sort of big problems with data and simulations in these massively interacting systems to solve societal problems. My particular domain of that has been infectious disease. Uh, and we've been working on this for over 20 years from back with the smallpox scare after 9-11, pandemic response for influenza, Ebola, Zika, many, many other diseases. And I'll give a quick little history here without belaboring it too much so we can get to some Q&A here. But back in 2005, we we're lucky enough to be part, one of the original members of this NIH MIDAS uh, consortium. We did a bunch of pandemic influenza planning. We did some studies and that was actually set up some of these arrays of social distancing measures that were needed to curb a pandemic. Uh, in 09, when the H1N1 pandemic did occur, uh, we supported the federal government, both with some uh, agent-based simulations that had an interactive tool set on top of it to try and do some initial parameter estimation. Uh, and then I actually spent a week or so embedded with um, HHS BARDA in downtown DC uh, right around Thanksgiving when we we're planning whether or not we might see a third wave of this pandemic as previous, as we've experienced with COVID, there's these waves that occur and we were concerned about whether there's gonna be a third one. So we did some uh, modeling to estimate the likelihood of that. And then in uh, 2014, the West African Ebola outbreak was a huge effort that involved sort of a weekly update of analysis and model results. We did a little bit of forecasting as well as doing some ad hoc analyses to see where you might wanna put um, ETU placements that would anticipate where future cases would be and minimize the distance that people would have to travel to get Ebola treatment. Um, in terms of specific infectious disease forecasting, um, Back in 2013-14, there was uh, the initial inaugural CDC flu forecasting uh, challenge. We were one of the teams that took up uh, that challenge. Um, we did reasonable, um, and we continued to participate year over year. Um, it was very nice collaborative modeling uh, study, more academic. Um, so it was a, a good experience there. Um, also engaged in an IARPA forecasting kind of a challenge as a research study that was more data mining approaches where we tried myriad weird proxies for disease. So we looked at like satellite images of parking lots to try and predict influenza burdens in like Brazil and uh, looked at open table reservations to try and use that as a predictor. Use natural language processing to automate line lists from newspaper articles so we could uh, get a line list of cases uh, for like the MERS outbreak so we could do some estimation on that. That was a coronavirus as well that people were very concerned might get pandemic um, and try and estimate some of the infectivity and uh, uh, disease parameters in there. And then there's this Ebola forecasting challenge after the 2014 uh, West African Ebola outbreak. It was an interesting study where a bunch of teams got together. One team modeled quote unquote real Ebola outbreaks and then they provided different levels of information about four separate different uh, trajectories to see if more information yielded more accurate um, forecasts. And uh, we did well in that challenge as well. And we learned quite a bit that the fog of war does distort the accuracy of some of these um, forecasts. And so just to echo on what Justin had mentioned about these, this language, the way we think about these types of prognostications or foresight, uh, you know, you have forecasts and that's more of a, a little bit more specific, like this is what you think will happen as everyone on this call is pretty uh, familiar with. Another thing we use often in the, in the modeling world is a projection. And so it's what could happen under certain conditions. So you're approaching a decision point and you're trying to evaluate whether you should spend so much more money to change a policy that might be more costly, but how much benefit might we get from it? So you can project out. Uh, and then counterfactuals is often one where we look at what the differences are if different decisions were taken or maybe will be uh, taken and to say, if you chose this versus you chose that, how different are these going to be? So you can evaluate uh, the potential benefits or estimate, you know, what actions in the past have netted you in terms of benefit. Because sometimes it's uh, easy to lose track of the fact that you have been doing good, and it's good to take stock of that. 
Uh, and obviously, depending on the task that you're uh, approaching, you know, the model design, the data that you need, uh, and the way that you might conduct your study all depends on these types of prognostications you're trying to make. Uh, forecasting is often more simple models with simple metrics. Often you need a pipeline so you can regularly update it. With projections, these can be a little bit more ad hoc. May you have a little bit more of a tailored model to address a very specific style of question. Uh, and then the counterfactuals require that you build into the model, you know, these key differences uh, so that they're actually represented um, structurally. Um, in terms of the COVID response, there's been a lot going on. There's no way to really fully cover it all without spending seven or eight slides. Briefly, I'll just say at the beginning, we looked at importation risk. We did some parameter estimation based on line list data. Again, that was being curated by community scientists. Um, we did some initial analyses at the national, international, city, state level. Uh, we're looking at New York City. We're looking at different countries in Europe. Uh, we're looking at the US. We're looking at Virginia. Um, we did then an extension of these models to get down to the county level so that we could have sort of consistent um, support at the national and state level uh, that was detailed enough to answer um, individual policymakers down at the county level, but also give a good overview at the sort of national level as well. To date, we've done over 100 different model, model and analysis updates. This has been going on for, I counted it, it's about 80 consecutive weeks where we've produced one of these weekly updates. And we've done this for Virginia very consistently and then at the US at a little bit more of a relaxed pace uh, but nonetheless, quite a few in there. Um, we've also participated in the CDC's forecasting hub uh, with some of our statistical models, as well as the scenario modeling hub, which actually takes more of a projection style approach and is trying to inform policy, for instance, about the five and 11 year old vaccination um, question that's up before the FDA right now. And then there's been a lot of other additional analyses um, about economic impact, contact tracing, biosurveillance, um, mobility policy impacts, vaccination clinic site placement, uh, a lot of different little uh, studies along the way, some of them that are still ongoing and others that were uh, done in the past. And just to briefly cover our general approach, um, basically we get the current update, we're pulling from lots of different sources. Uh, we analyze these sources and summarize them. Some of these plots right here sort of give a story here where we look at the trajectory um, you know, every little health district inside of Virginia. Uh, we're analyzing variant levels. Delta is sort of maintained saturation, so there's not a lot of action there, but with Alpha, Delta, the other uh, variants that have sort of cropped up here and there and then faded off, uh, we're constantly paying attention to that. Looking at vaccination rates, you can see these huge spikes in terms of demand for vaccination and levels of vaccine that have been administered. Um, we're looking at acceptance, so we're looking at different survey results that say how many people in different parts of Virginia are willing to become vaccinated. Uh, and then we sort of put that together with these short-term forecasts that are off of these statistical models, and then we scaffold our projections and fit to those and then provide uh, the projections in the future. Uh, you can see a little animation here in the top right. This adaptive fitting technique basically we have a variety of different parameters uh, surrounding the disease. And then we take each one of those particles and deliberately fit the transmissibility value. Uh, so we capture the whole history of the pandemic to date, which is becoming longer and longer uh, and a little bit more computationally challenging to track the whole time. But that way we have a good record of when different groups of people got infected. And so we can measure things like waning immunity. We then design um, scenarios and we project forward under these different conditions. So for instance, one of the conditions this fall winter 2020 is if the core drivers of last fall through this winter uh, replayed, um, but we take into account that now that we're dealing with Delta rather than the ancestral strain, um, what might things look like? And so that's sort of a bad case scenario. We have increased transmission and we get a lot more cases generated. Another alternative is if we have surge control. So over the previous couple of weeks, we've had this huge surge of cases. Luckily, we're into the decline phase at this point right now. Uh, and if we further were able to reduce transmission, uh, what, how much more quickly could we come out of that versus what the current trends are? And so that's, in a nutshell, uh, the approach that we take. We produce a variety of outcomes. So we're looking at confirmed cases, deaths, hospitalizations. We try and estimate these hospital occupancies. Justin showed a plot very similar to this in the top right, where we're sort of trying to maintain how long until we get to exceeding the capacity of the different uh, hospital systems in the different regions of the Commonwealth. 
Um, and then again, as we said, like we do this at the county level. So, you know, you look here at the adaptive projection from um, last week, I believe, and you can see that in certain areas, you have a little bit of growth. Other areas, you have more rapid decline. So if you're the mayor in Richmond, uh, you want to focus in down here, whereas if you're out in the southwest in Mount Rogers or in the New River District, you might be more concerned over there. And so we try and give these broad, simple um, projections that uh, can be applicable to a, a broad audience. The challenges, you know, basically designing these meaningful scenarios always um, is tricky. We certainly don't always pick ones that are useful. We don't always anticipate emerging phenomenon, right? So we try and stay nimble. So it's always sort of every couple of weeks, we sort of revisit whether these new, we need to make some new scenarios. Um, anticipating what the next major driver of transmission, often it arrives in a way that's really hard to measure or is very poorly measured, even if we do know about it. Um, and so that's always tricky. And so we're always scouring the literature and looking outside of Virginia, outside of the United States for uh, possibilities. Uh, and then there's another challenge of just redesigning these models to take into account these new features of the pandemic um, while we're still flying the plane and still providing these weekly uh, updates. And then operationally, we've just had the same things that many, everyone that's lived through this pandemic has dealt with is uh, different team members need some downtime, need some vacation time, um, computational resources sometimes. You know, we've got a pretty nice computer here at Un University of Virginia that we use, uh, but sometimes people have paper deadlines and there is crunch times where we run into some horse trading to be able to make sure we get our models done by the Wednesday deadline that we have. Um, and then obviously they're always changing the data formats and things, those kinds of things always get dealt with. Um, with that, I'd like to go ahead and pass it off to Srini and I will stop sharing so he can drive it. Oh, he's taken over. Thank you. You can hear me and see the slides. Yeah, uh, thanks Brian. Uh, I think Brian covered a lot of the ground in terms of the computational models. Uh, so uh, as an intro, like I'm Shane Agatamran, I'm a research assistant professor. My background is in uh, electrical engineering and uh, since joining this group six years back, started building some of these computational models and getting more and more used to thinking like an epidemiologist. And I try my best uh, with, with a lot of help. Uh, and so what I wanted to cover uh, in this time that we have is like uh, how people have thought about uh, human judgment in the context of influenza uh, or infectious disease forecasting in general and how we want to uh, go forward with the collaboration with Metaculous and VDH. So here are some examples of uh, some of the past efforts and uh, like on the left is like Epicas is a, uh, a product that came out of like uh, researchers from uh, CMU. And uh, here, they, what they were trying to do was like influence the forecasting, but they built a uh, web interface for uh, individuals to actually draw a trajectory. So uh, this is almost like uh, sketching out the future trajectory of the pandemic or like in this case, a uh, seasonal influenza by looking at all the past seasons and then uh, you have the current trajectory and then just draw on top of it. And week after week, you go in there and you can edit your forecast by seeing whether you're still tracking it. It was a very nice interface and more importantly, it was consistently more accurate than a lot of the other statistical models. And part of the reason was, this was again, uh, this is a feature that you'll see across all these three different efforts in the past, that these were small, very focused uh, expert ensembles. Uh, so there were like 15, 20, uh, like in this case of Epicars, it would be uh, postdocs or like lab members uh, and others are also uh, epidemiologists or public health planners or grad students in our case. Uh, so in, in a lot of these, uh, the scaling was not done uh, intentionally to, uh, uh, like to understand like how experts can combine models. So I think we have a unique opportunity working with uh, uh, all of you at uh, uh, Metaculars, like uh, the community ha is, has really grown and we're really excited to see like how we can scale this and take it to the next level. Uh, and so like just quickly going to the other examples, like uh, while the first one was like more of a trajectory forecasting, there we built a, a model which actually uh, we thought like instead of making individuals make the forecast, models can actually generate a lot of forecasts. And just like uh, Justin was mentioning, it's difficult for uh, policymakers to look at multiple models and decide which one will actually play out. And so uh, what we built was an inter interactive platform called MyForsight, where uh, ranking existing models can be done, like where individual models will be uh, displayed for the user and they can actually rank these models by just dragging and dropping. And they can also provide a confidence on like how uh, maybe they, 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 they're very 
particular about this particular model being number one, but then they're not so confident about the remaining rankings. And that was a uh, interesting way to combine modeling with uh, human judgment. And uh, another example that we see on the right is where like this is uh, from the influence of forecasting efforts that were done uh, in collaboration with CDC. And again, all the models that were submitted there, some of the models uh, uh, were collected based on their past performance and their probability distributions of like what the first week ahead looks like or second week ahead. And these targets were displayed again to a very select audience and they were asked to select one of the models. So the reason I'm showing all of this is because like the models that Brian talked about uh, and the models that we're using for COVID-19 are slightly more complicated and more importantly, they have uh, a lot more uh, uh, variables at play in terms of parameters and unknowns. So I just want to quickly go through this because Brian has already covered this. Like uh, the framework that we have, one of the framework that we use for forecasting is the statistical ensemble. It's actually a learned ensemble, which uh, takes in a lot of individual methods like uh, uh, LSTM networks or uh, autoregressive models or Kalman filters, and then looks at their performance over the re uh, recent past and then reweights them uh, using a scoring function and then uh, re uh, recombines them to provide a short-term forecast. And this is the kind of method that we've been uh, using for providing the CDC forecast hub. And as Brian mentioned, we also use this to kind of augment the ground truth for uh, short-term projections. And it's been doing reasonably well. And here's a, uh, and this is, all of these models are run at the county level. So 3000 different counties and like uh, eight, eight to 10 different models running for each of them. And you do see in some phases, they're pretty good at tracking, especially when there is not a lot of uncertainty and the models kind of agree. But then the, uh, uh, once the models start diverging, especially because of their structure, and we are going through these different change points, uh, it, it is not very nimble at tracking, okay, we have reached a peak, we should not depend on model A, we should actually switch to model B. And this, this is the kind of intelligence that uh, like a human expert or even a, a community can look at it and say like, I, I think what's playing out is more like model B and I'll wait that more. And so that's one kind of input that might be really helpful. And uh, the, going to the other framework, uh, that, uh, which is the workhorse of our projections, this, is, uh, this it incorporates a lot of these mechanistic details of how disease spread and like epidemic waves emerge. And uh, so things like, uh, what, is, what does the zero survey from CDC say? Like uh, how many vaccines uh, have been administered so far? And then what variant is prevalent? And all of these are combined in uh, uh, a mechanistic fashion through a, a SEIR style model. And uh, we also layer in future scenarios on top of this to provide like projections that are pre very similar to what Justin and Brian had showed. And what I would like to highlight here again is uh, the notion that like once we have these scenarios, these are all uh, if something happens in terms of the future, like if, if a particular vaccine uptake happens, like if you look at the orange curves on the uh, solid line and the dashed line, they're basically distinguishing the same kind of uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions are uh, a kind of mixing during uh, the fall winter season. The only distinguishing factor is a more optimistic vaccine uptake. And what is difficult to ascertain is whether uh, uh, the optimistic vaccine or the status quo will play out. And uh, so that's, that's another place where we think uh, community insights will be very valuable. So looking at how uh, we're thinking about is like uh, how to enhance this partnership is like three different ways of uh, using uh, community forecasting platforms like Metaculous. Like first one is uh, a model parameterization approach where a model requires a particular parameter. Like uh, one of the questions that we had, uh, and I'll get to that quickly. Uh, the, uh, we were looking at like what percentage of cases converted to hospitalization, or you can ask questions which are what percentage of infections are not being detected as cases. And these are parameters that the model requires to be able to understand the system fairly well. And uh, some of it is embedded in literature, there's conflicting estimates, and some of it is actually through some simple data analysis or building a separate model. And, uh, and uh, all of these have some kind of resolution, either in the future or even in the current literature once we ensemble them. And uh, so some of these questions might take that form of uh, estimating these parameters. And uh, a closely related uh, uh, version of this is the scenario specification. Uh, where you're ask, actually asking questions about the future. So which of these might play out? Uh, do we think there'll be higher uh, uptake for booster shots or higher uptake for childhood vaccinations? 
and the, some of these signals are there in the news media or uh, in terms of uh, all the surveys that we look at. But some of these are actually uh, have to be ensemble because they, they again have conflicting opinions and uh, a, a community estimate is something uh, more reliable than uh, individual surveys. And uh, the final option is like more, more like uh, the ones that I was describing using the different curves where uh, if you're thinking about projections, uh, the models are capable of producing individual projections under conditions and the community can vote on which of these scenarios are likely to play out. And there are interesting variants to this where like you might agree with how the trajectory plays out, but you may not agree with the rationale. And uh, there is uh, there's always a resolution because you can look at what plays out over five, four or five weeks and then resolve them. But it would be interesting to actually come up with these weights for these projections. And similarly, uh, one could test uh, how well like communities can reweight these individual statistical models uh, and compare it against something like a, a trained ensemble. And uh, again, I, I'll quickly go through what we tried out during the Lightning Tournament. This was done in collaboration with BDH and Metaculous. And some of you uh, actually participated, but just a quick overview and some insights that we got from them. These were four weekly rounds of seven questions that we ran through the month of August uh, up until Labor Day. And the questions were actually open for just four days, like Wednesday to Sunday. And a lot of these were short-term indicators of uh, epidemiological quantities or behavioral indicators. And we did throw in a couple of questions about model parameters to see how we would be able to use them. And there was a lot of engagement, like almost all questions had 40 plus predictions and especially questions that were uh, in the news, like for instance, booster doses or childhood vaccinations, they received the largest number of predictions. Uh, and in most cases, these predictions remain stable during the sh short term window. And quick insights that we got, like these are uh, short term trends that were observed in the epidemiological questions. And uh, what we wanted to do is like, we basically repeated the same question uh, week after week with one week horizon. So uh, uh, like for instance, what you're seeing on the left is a test positivity question that was asked on August 15th and then August 22nd and so on with like one week out. And what we were noticing was uh, in a lot of these, there is a quick correction of course that the community does like in the case of test and these arrows are meant to guide you the uh, red arrow basically indicates uh, an under prediction compared to the ground truth whereas the green arrow indicates an over prediction and uh, some cases it, it does overshoot but most often it corrects course fairly well uh, week after week and so on the left you see the test positivity and, and on the right we were asking about hospitalization and it's interesting to see that initially after over predicting the community kind of corrected course but then missed a surge that happened uh, right around the second week of September. And these are uh, useful things to note where like uh, we understand what kind of metrics we can actually uh, use community uh, forecasts for. And again, uh, another thing that happened uh, around that same time frame is uh, with Delta surge, uh, mask wearing was becoming more and more common. And uh, through this uh, four uh, weeks, we actually asked the question of what will be the percentage of people wearing masks according to a survey. Uh, uh, done by the CMU and Facebook folks. And we did see uh, consistently lagging behind the resurgence. And these are change points, which might be, uh, they were tracking the uh, direction of growth, but not exactly the intensity. Uh, and similarly, like when you look at something like vaccine uptake, uh, it was uh, really optimistic. I mean, in, in fact, like the first week ahead, they actually got it to almost within 200 doses, uh, the uh, seven day moving average. But then like after a, a brief uh, phase of uh, under prediction, uh, it, it did actually over predict in the last couple of rounds. And part of this was like, uh, there was a lot of anticipation in the community uh, right after Labor Day where uh, the FDA authorization had come in and people were, and in general, I think uh, every one of us were expecting vaccines uh, resurgence, uh, vaccine uptake to resurgence. So, uh, and uh, some of the questions that we had, uh, I won't go into some of these details, but like uh, we did ask questions about long-term forecasts. And here are some predictions that the community has made, and these will be resolved only by January. But uh, it's interesting to know that the community thinks 16% of uh, five through 11 year olds will get partially vaccinated by end of 2021, and about 17% of uh, Virginians would receive a booster shot. And some of these forecasts do have these bimodal, uh, bimodal features, where like a significant proportion think that this won't happen, or uh, like maybe the uh, booster shot won't get approved, or for instance, the 5 to 11 uh, won't get UA. 
And uh, so these are the kind of settings where uh, some things like a conditional forecast where assuming that X happens, uh, what is the probability that you assign for a particular update? Those kind of questions might become relevant. Uh, and we also tried out some of these model parameterizations uh, using the case to hospitalization ratio. And uh, this was this is a, a slightly more detailed thing than we can get into uh, around this time. But the, the core of this is like we, we were asking the question of like what percentage of cases will become hospitalizations, and it it had remained fairly steady for almost four or five months. And uh, the, the the forecasts uh, were pretty much spot on on what a statistical model would estimate, which is roughly around four percent. But since then, there has been some uh, changes uh, in the pandemic scores partly due to uh, uh, the va vaccine surge, but also like Delta and uh, the uh, overall immunity playing uh, different kinds of uh, factors. And we've seen that like now it's converging more towards a 2%. And this again highlights uh, when there is a change point, how to uh, reweight these models and how to take these parameters with a, a pinch of salt. And uh, so with that, uh, I'll get to this uh, more interesting part, like uh, what we think as paths forward we are, we are trying to set up something like a follow-up to this lightning tournament, and uh, we would like to have more direct model-based questions now that we have uh, a fair enough understanding of the different parameters that can be forecast by the community. And uh, through these, we'll start setting up uh, some things like metaculous uh, informed scenarios or even metaculous uh, selected scenarios. And uh, we would like to uh, regularly engage with the community uh, on like both letting them know how we're integ integrating these forecasts, but also get constant feedback on like what kind of questions they would like to answer. So with that, maybe I'll open the uh, uh, floor for a discussion, but like just, I wanted to prompt uh, a few uh, discussion points. Uh, and these are things that are uh, very curious for all of us at uh, UVA and definitely at uh, MetaPlus and VDH also. Uh, for instance, like some of these things uh, we would like to know from forecasters are, how do you approach these questions? Uh, do you use any data analytics tools or do you actually think of them uh, in individual uh, question form or like do you actually collectively assess the entire set of questions and how often do you update these forecasts? And again, uh, what kind of questions or formats would you like to see or uh, what other ways would you like to engage with the modelers? Uh, so we are open to these questions and suggestions. So I'll uh, see the floor now, uh, Ivan. Uh, one, did, did you have anything to add, uh, uh, Christian? Yes. Uh, so I, I think that uh, even before we get to some of these forecast questions for the the attendees, and maybe we can circle back to those. Uh, we do have a few questions here in the Q and A queue. So it would be great if uh, um, we're going to have Juan read out some of these questions, and I'll, I'll just encourage all panelists. Anyone who's here as a panelist, you are welcome to address any of these questions. And then once we work through these questions, um, we can. Uh, I would love for them to uh, for you to have that back and forth screening with uh, the forecasting community here. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, so I think that's how we will uh, proceed. So, and then beyond the uh, questions we have in that Q and A list, if you are an attendee and you would like to verbally pose your question, just raise your hand in the chat, and I will, you know, I will power up your mic. Uh, all right, and so with that, I'll turn it over to Juan. Great. Um, so this first question, I think, might especially be relevant to Justin, um, given the types of questions we've asked in the VDH tournament. Um, to what extent does VDH make use of forecasts that resolve early? So um, questions that resolve shortly after opening. Um, you know, I think that would really depend on the question. The one that uh, springs to mind was uh, uh, whether Virginia would uh, have a vaccine mandate for the state. I think that one uh, opened uh, and closed before I was able, even able to look at what the uh, the forecast was. Um, you know, and I, I think if they close it at that speed, um, a lot of times, you know, these the situation is changing quickly. Um, so we. Um, you know, we're kind of learning at the same time sometimes. And when they uh, happen that quickly, um, uh, you know, I'm not sure that we have an opportunity to make too much of, of, uh, of the forecasts uh, in that way. Um, does that make sense? Uh, you know, if we, if they're, you know, last a month or more, you know, this forecast can be very helpful still, of course. I mean, knowing when something or what it will be and, and that'll be, 
you know, happen sooner, it, you know, is, is, is very helpful for us. Uh, the next question, I think, um, can be answered by any of the panelists, so feel free to jump in. Um, the, how can models be modified or used in a rural context where there might not be as much data available to construct models? Yeah, and I can jump in on that as well. Yeah, I mean, when I made that list of applications for fuming forecasting, you could really just say anything where there's insufficient data or not reliable data, uh, you know, to feed a model. And models need data. Uh, you know, they need that information uh, is where human forecasting can jump in. And I can see the rural areas being uh, uh, an application of that if we're not having enough power uh, in those areas. Um, one of the things that springs to mind when I saw that question is when uh, colleges reopened uh, last September, uh, really about this time, we had uh, you know new, new testing regimes at those colleges and we were seeing cases shoot up in some of our college towns with smaller rural populations. Um, and of course the modeling picked that up and I was like, oh my gosh, here's a huge outbreak. We you know don't know what to do, we expect it to continue. So the projections got really high really quickly. And that's just how those type of models work. And so what we were thinking on the back end, seeing that, well, it's, uh, you know, it's probably being picked up by the colleges. We knew it was being picked up by the colleges, but we didn't know uh, what that meant. Would there then be an outbreak in the college towns? Um, you know, barbecues and bars, that's what students do, you know? Um, and we had seen a lot of outbreaks related to that. So we didn't know if that was gonna happen in our college towns as well. Um, uh, so I think, you know, uh, Human forecasting would have been great to have in that situation to kind of sort out uh, what we were seeing and what we, uh, you know, what we might have expected from our college, uh, you know, return to school uh, at that time. And if I can add quickly to that, uh, I think uh, Justin brought up a very important point. There are a lot of these different factors, or even, even though we are running 3,000 different counties, uh, each of these have uh, demographic features and also like social structures age groups and also like uh, uh, like whether they have a college town or like meat packing plant or a prison. And all of these are factors that are, uh, the model can integrate some of these, but the model does not know what it does not know. Uh, and uh, so to some extent, what we are trying to uh, understand is like maybe some there, there is some local context or there is some uh, understanding of uh, how these different variables play a role. And we've been building uh, some of these uh, correlates or like trying to understand how these different demographic features uh, uh, can help us understand how quickly uh, uh, a trajectory can change because uh, uh, a large uh, state or a, a city might have a much more predictable outbreak because it has momentum to some extent. There's a very small uh, rural town uh, might suddenly experience an outbreak and since there's a lot of uh, hotspots, people uh, just like the, there's an outbreak that just goes through the entire population very quickly. And these are things that I think uh, uh, human judgment uh, can actually distinguish. And uh, we can, by combining those with like all the machine learning tools that we are building for classifying by demographic features, uh, we can do much better than by individually. Hey, Juan, this is, this is can you hear me? Yep, yep. Well, another feature of this that doesn't exist is that if you had forecasters, lots of them in small geographic, you know, areas that are not covered well statistically, um, that's something that, you know, could, who knows, could be a future endeavor for some, some, some approach, but having boots on the ground and understanding from a community perspective is something that is useful in different public health applications. It's just not easy to implement. Maybe Justin has a comment there. But it's, it, it's something for forecasters in a way. You can flip it back to if you had enough forecasters in those areas and you didn't have the statistical data, would that provide a viable model? Yeah, those are great answers. So overall, the theme of using human judgmental forecasting in those contexts where data is lacking, that makes sense. Um, the next question I think um, is especially applicable to the UVA folks. So what led um, you all to your current set of scenarios uh, for your projections? Yeah, I can take a shot. Again, uh, 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 what we do is almost like a collaborative approach. Like we make these presentations 
to Justin and his team and like uh, hospital folks. And uh, uh, on a weekly basis, we have like two to three different presentations to different stakeholders. So as we do this, we understand like the kind of questions that are coming up on the horizon. And uh, we have a discussion about like what kind of scenarios uh, are relevant for the decisions that are coming up in the future or even for communication. And uh, for instance, the kind of scenarios that we have right now are driven by two factors. One, uh, by doing some data analysis, we noticed that the kind of uh, uh, trends that we're noticing right now in terms of transmissibility, uh, when we correct for the effect of Delta, like that's the biggest unknown that we uh, saw over the last few months. Uh, so when we correct for that increased transmissibility and the vaccination and everything in the model, what we see is very similar trends to what we saw uh, during uh, late last fall. And that prompted us this question. So uh, what would something like last fall winter surge uh, during January, what will it look like in the world of Delta, but with all these vaccinations? And that's a question that's lingering in almost all of our minds. And we wanted the model to uh, actually project that as one of those projections. And again, like uh, the other layers that we have there are these optimistic vaccination, given that there is a lot of push in uh, both increasing the age groups that are eligible, but also making booster shots uh, available. There's a question of what will this optimistic vaccine rollout achieve, uh, especially in the middle of a surge. And uh, so that's why we built these optimistic vaccine scenarios. And these are constantly evolving. And if uh, you go back and look at the archives, you'll see uh, just like what Justin showed in the beginning, like we had these slow and pause scenarios to start with in April of 2020, and they've uh, had a, a, a long evolution from that point to now. So Justin, did you have anything to add? Um, no, just that it's a great collaborative process between VDH uh, and the UVA team. And then uh, uh, usually uh, Carter Price from Rand is able to join as well and, and just provide a good insight on what we should be looking at. And, uh, you know, UVA team builds great scenarios around that. Great. Um, so this next question is from Bojtek. Um, So this is regarding how to introduce forecasting to decision makers. Um, so how do you go about uh, making that introduction to forecasting and um, make it so that decision makers are willing to incorporate forecasting into their deliberations. Yes, yeah, so uh, this type of, uh, you know, the forecasting tournament, uh, you know, as I kind of mentioned, can be a hard sell to some uh, uh, folks. We were lucky in our case to have a legislature later who made the connection um, and that you know, when you have a legislator that's interested or an elected official, uh, you know, I think that really uh, you know, helps kind of uh, uh, grease people. You know, it, it provides some cover and some impetus for, uh, you know, uh, uh, those of us in the executive branch to, to begin, uh, uh, you know, working on those uh, types of projects. But uh, introducing it overall, I think um, you have to be able to, um, provide that evidence base. So the Good Judgment Project was, you know, that huge project that provided a lot of the uh, evidence and background for it. So I always try to talk about that. I always try to talk about uh, the, how it was based in the IARPA tournament, uh, which is our intelligence advanced research project, uh, which lends credibility. Uh, and then you can dive into that background and then the specific, um, uh, you know, use cases that you're beginning to see pop up. I mean, I mentioned that uh, you know few other states uh, have used this, but a few have, uh, and I think this collaboration is the most extensive so far in this, this realm between a, a state government and um, a, a human forecasting uh, platform, uh, at least that uh, you know I'm aware of uh, and, and seen publicly. Um, so um, I think it's uh, uh, you know as, as those begin to grow, I think it'll get more you know more use cases behind it. We'll, we'll uh, add credibility. This next question, I think, is um, especially relevant to the UVA folks. So um, how do you attempt to model the difference between confirmed cases and actual cases and how that difference changes over time? Sure. I mean, I think that's one of the uh, biggest unknowns that we've had ever since the beginning of the pandemic, because one of the uh, first surprises that we got when before, like all these variants that are in the news now, is this high level of asymptomaticity with respect to COVID-19. And that really put a, a damper on like understanding how the testing uh, needs to adapt to how uh, we control the pandemic. 
And what we initially did was like, there, there was a paper that came out of, uh, like this was back in March and April when we started setting up our models. And there was a paper uh, that uh, analyzed the data out of Wuhan and came up with this estimate of close to one in seven uh, infections uh, are, are the ones that are getting confirmed. So we had this kind of a rough scaling factor uh, to begin with. And then once uh, we started adapting it for US context, uh, some of the data sets that have been helpful for us is understanding the test positivity rate, like how uh, once a test positivity rate goes high, you, uh, you tend to uh, interpret it as more cases are getting missed. And uh, more recently, or uh, like more, uh, since October, August of 2020, I said uh, that uh, the zero surveys started becoming available at the nat uh, national level for CDC. So by comparing what the model's uh, estimate of infections are compared to the zero surveys, we were able to kind uh, come up with this correction factor of like 2x to 3x uh, in terms of uh, the number of infections to the confirmed cases. Great, yeah. Um, this next question I think is relevant to both UVA and VDH. Um, so Ryan Beck asks, uh, have there been any metaculous questions where the community prediction surprised you or slightly shifted your thinking? So anyone can feel free to jump in. Yeah, I can jump in first on that. Um, I don't know that I was surprised by this predict prediction, but I know um, a lot of people were. So it was over the summer when cases were really low uh, here in Virginia, really um, uh, just kind of bouncing around the bottom there in a lot of counties. Uh, you know, every, people were getting com pretty complacent uh, about cases, but the, uh, the metaculous forecast regarding variants uh, and particularly the ones that might uh, escape immu immunity, uh, vaccine immunity that we had out there, that was uh, the uh, chance of that happening, uh, uh, you know, was pretty high um, uh, from the start. Uh, and we were able to talk about that uh, quite a bit, um, along with the other evidence out there about Delta, with everyone thinking about Delta, you know, what is it going to hit here? And I think having that forecast really, uh, you know, was, was influential and, and kind of helped us start to, people start to understand that uh, this was probably something uh, that was coming to Virginia. Uh, and and uh, so uh, caught a lot of people off guard, I think, that, that forecast when a lot of people were really uh, enjoying what was kind of a break after a year of, of fighting COVID uh, in our realm. We're about a quarter, at, oh, sorry, were you about to speak? Was it Srini? No, nothing specific. I, I think like uh, one of the things that I showed there was the vaccinations that we had about boosters and childhood vaccination. That's something that we're still trying to understand based on what might be the uptake. And so the results in general have influenced our scenario discussions. Uh, so. It's not it surprised us, but like it has uh, definitely influenced our way of thinking about those uh, problems. So I, I wanted to mention that uh, you know we're about a quarter after the hour, and certainly any panelists who uh, need to leave uh, who have commitments, uh, you, you should feel free. But also, Serena, I wanted to encourage you, if you're able, to bring your slide back up with your questions for the forecasters, and then if there are any forecasters in attendance uh, who would you know, be willing to provide a response on any of these items, it's certainly very welcome. And Christian, this is Mark. Um, I have a couple of additional questions too that, that I can throw out there for that people. Great. Just let me know when. Yeah, I would say you should feel free to ask you to add, just verbalize your questions and then any forecasters in attendance, if you see any question listed here or if you hear a question by Mark that piques your interest or you feel like you have a, have an answer for, it can be a short answer, a long answer, uh, then feel free to raise your hand and I'll, I'll activate your mic. Okay, so let me just, I just have two or three here. Um, and these are general, and I'm just curious about the process. I'm a psychologist, so I'm curious about how people you know, think. So one is, um, do, do forecasters use any kind of deliberate and conscious strategies for trying to counter any biases they might think they have in making predictions. The second one is um, about social sensing and local signals that you might get. Um, say, for example, about if you had to predict the, the vaccination uptake, maybe you see people at clinics as you're driving by. That kind of information may be good or bad, I don't know, but is that ever used um, either consciously or unconsciously, or do you try to discount that? That could also go along with a bias question. Um, and then the third question is, how 
uh, forecasters think about um, potential rare events in the prediction window and how do they accommodate those? So that's my, those are my three questions to add. Christian, there are two hands up if you wanted to then speak. Yes, I've given those two attendees uh, the ability to turn on their mics. So uh, Ryan Beck or V50, uh, either of you can uh, feel free. Ryan, go ahead. Yeah, sure. Uh, on your question about uh, social sensing, I guess uh, I try to kind of avoid that where possible because anecdotes, you know, can be misleading, but there are some times that I do get informed by that. For example, um, I think there were some questions about uh, retail employment in the Virginia tournament. And just recently, you know, I'm walking around in the last couple of months, seeing all the, all the signs up asking for hires. Like this was kind of before, I think it had really broken into the national kind of consciousness that this was going on. Like it was just starting to filter in but just seeing all the signs looking for work or like local businesses being closed down in open hours because of that, that kind of led me to believe, hey, maybe maybe this is something that, you know, their hiring is gonna be picking up in the future or things along those lines. Um, are you guys hearing me? Um, I think, um, I think you, you might find that, uh, Oh, oh, I should say my screen name is Key Ballot. Um, I don't know why I was signed in with the model of my phone, but whatever. Um, I think uh, as far as bias, I don't know if this is the kind of thing that you were referring to, but I make a constant effort on the COVID predictions to eliminate the bias for um, hope and optimism. Um, if the if the data leaves leads me to be optimistic, then great. But um, just because people are saying, "Oh, we're about to turn the corner," um, I, you know, I have to filter that out when when I look at whatever data I look at. Um, and uh, also, I should say that I, I have uh, I, I have um, plants in Virginia who who you know, I mean, I don't get a lot of info from them, but you know. I'll, I'll check in with them about, uh, you know, is traffic picking up or are the hospitals filling up or whatever. Um, yeah, I've checked in with them a couple of times just to get some, you know, on the ground uh, reality checks. Do you have plants all over the country? I mean, I'm, I'm not kidding. It's, I know it sounds like a joke, but, but the question is, do you find that your, your, uh, predict, it, it, your predictions um, you know, depend on the quality of your plants ever. I don't know. Just yeah, yes. Uh, um, uh, that I really can't use anyone. First of all, you know, first time I ask them something, if, if I think that their answer is, you know, just if they're not tuning in to what it is, um, then I won't use them again. But also really, um, I have to, I think the most important thing is that I have, whatever level of confidence I have in their ability to process information and give me an answer. So, um, you know, one of my Virginian plants actually doesn't live in Virginia anymore, but um, she's a small business owner. She needs to take data into account every day or every week or whatever, look at inventory numbers. And of course, with COVID, it was a big challenge. Um, so, I, you know, I mean, I didn't, I had known her before and I trusted her ability to process data, but I mean, yeah, that's an example of someone who's good. And um, I do have people all over the country because I went to school with people who scattered all over the country. So, okay. Okay. Well, um, unless any other forecaster wants to use this last chance to jump in, um, I, Wanted to thank the panel for uh, the great talks um, and to all the spectacular forecasters. Um, sorry, my screen froze for a second. Um, yeah, I wanted to thank all the uh, panelists for their great talks and for answering um, the questions of the forecasters. Um, 
and all the Metaculous forecasters for um, attending and participating in these two tournaments um, and to all of the rest of the attendees. Um, yeah, so uh, we also wanted to announce uh, uh, and use this opportunity uh, to add that we have some exciting news. Um, we have the winners of the Virginia Lightning Round Tournament um, who have won Metaculous hoodies and UVA Biocomplexity Institute mugs. Um, so congratulations to users Ryan Beck, Jonathan Shi, um, and Simon M. We'll contact all of you individually to arrange getting your prizes to you. Um, and yeah, and to everyone else, thank you again for attending. Um, this was great. I hope you found it as helpful as I did. Um, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Thanks all. Yeah, thank you all.